Welcome, this is Professor Seal here to talk about chapters one and two. Today we're going to paint in really broad strokes about what is theater and what is a play and uh, why maybe the institutions of learning such as Motlow State Community College would require you to take theater. That's probably the biggest question that I get at the beginning of a semester is um, what is this class? Why do I have to take this class? Um, just want to remind you there was a welcome video. If you skipped that important step, I would like to encourage you to go back and watch that welcome video. I have students who come to the end of the semester and say, wait, we have to write uh, two papers? I didn't know about that. So just make sure that you get an overarching um, scope of what the class includes so that you can have that in your mind's eye and be preparing for it because we want to make sure um, especially in an online environment that you get everything you need in order to succeed so didn't mean for that to rhyme <laughs> so uh, what is theater theater is play right theater is play and um, before a child talks they sing before they write they draw as soon as they stand they dance art is fundamental to the human expression uh, Felicia Rashad um, Miss Cosby as I like to think of her but play and theater are synonymous and um, often going to a play can feel like child's play. Um, you know, it's not only in English that play and theater are synonymous, it's many different languages. Uh, Chinese, German, um, all of them are synonymous for play and theater because theater is something that, there's my little four-year-old son, Elliot Judah, um, it's something that we innately do, right? My son pretends to be an insect, he pretends to be a dog or a cat. And it's something that I didn't have to encourage him to do that. It's not because I walk around pretending to be a dog or a cat. It's something he intrinsically does, is play imaginatively. He also impersonates, right? Um, he'll figure something out by mimicking it or miming it. Uh, if you've ever had a small child or been around small children, you know a lot of what they're learning is just by copying what you do, right? If you... Um, say a word they're gonna say that word unfortunately sometimes um, uh, but it can, can go a little deeper than that right we um, idealize our characters Halloween is my favorite holiday Christmas is for the birds Halloween is where it's at um, I love dressing up as characters I love playing with costumes and of course my son is so small he can't um, do anything about me putting costumes on him. <laughs> I know the day will come when when he gets to pick his own costumes but um, you know on the left there you can see a picture of him in a kilt. I am of Scottish heritage and uh, loved Braveheart growing up and I call him my wee Scotsman because he's stubborn um, but you can see my niece and nephew. Uh, they're a little bit older so they've picked Minecraft and unicorns. Um, you know recently in the news as I'm recording this there's been a recasting of a live-action um, Aladdin, a live-action Little Mermaid and people are all upset or excited about casting for these characters because these characters aren't just um, you know for me as a little red-headed girl the Little Mermaid was something iconic it was one of the first characters I saw that was beautiful with red hair it wasn't Pippi Longstockings or um, or a little orphan Annie, you know, it was it was a legitimately beautiful red-headed character. Um, that said, I'm absolutely thrilled with the new casting for the live-action Little Mermaid, but we have these ideas, you know, uh, for other people it's who's your Batman, you know, looking at all the different Batman who've been played the part, who was your favorite character who played it, and these, these become part of who we um, who we live into, who we imagine ourselves to be, right? Um, you know, having our own heroes and the people that we look up to is important even as early as childhood. But play has a darker side too. G.K. Chesterton called it the dangerous imagination, right? When a child plays hide and seek, they're psychologically preparing for something 
that is truly terrifying for them to be separated from their parents, to be alone, to be scared, to have to hide for their life. Um, plays aren't just something that we put on for fun and fluffy entertainment. Um, plays can also be us playing out our deeper fears. And when we expand our mind and play with our imagination like that, it can go to a dark place. But play has been proven to be something that isn't just for children right? Um, There's a lot of psychological research about this, and I'd encourage you, um, if you have struggled with anxiety um, or depression, to really look into play and um, play theory and how it's important, because it's something intrinsically that we do. We make room to throw a ball or dance or whatever feels like play to you, to let our minds wander and to Um, enjoy the moment and be present in the moment. So um, play is something that is psychologically intrinsic for us. And formalized plays are what we think of as theater, right? But we know, and we'll talk about this later in the lecture, that play is something intrinsic that happened in all cultures. There's recordings of it um, happening all over the world. So um, when people ask me, why do I have to take theater? Um, I would argue that uh, theater can um, create a sense of play for you, a sense of um, enjoyment in something deeply meaningful. So um, I've established theater as play. Theater is also something that happens live right? Um, Your textbook has this term non-mediated theater and that is to say that it's not a recording or a radio play. It's something that um, human flesh and blood interaction that's going on. I have a pretty primal example of a theater here, an ancient uh, Grecian theater. This is um, uh, Theater Dionysus um, or Dionysia, sorry, and that is um, thousands of years old, right? And you can see thousands of people would sit in those theaters and have a live face-to-face interaction. So for your big cumulative paper that you'll write for this class at the end of the semester, you are um, doing a live theater production critique. And I'm asking you not to watch a YouTube video of the play. I'm asking you not to watch a recorded movie of a play such as Fences or Into the Woods. I'm asking you to go have a live theatrical experience because it's different, right? In some ways it's the same, but in many, many more important ways it's different. So there's a picture of me in London at the recreated Globe Theatre, Shakespeare's Theatre, um, the Globe, that sits on the Thames River. Um, Theatre as a live experiment is so engaging to me. I think it it brings out um, your imagination. It helps you to... Um, really throw yourself into the performance and for me as a huge Shakespeare fan seeing a play in the globe was a priceless experience right it's a priceless experience Um, your textbook is called the lively art um, because you know theater is exciting it's amusing and it's different from other art forms so you could have taken for your theater credit uh, music I mean, for your art credit, you could have taken music, you could have taken um, a static art form like painting, uh, appreciating paintings or statues. But we call theater the lively art um, because while it does have real art on stage, right, I would argue that um, many costumes are pieces of art, um, pa- painted backdrops is, are pieces of art, um, it is also something that happens in real time, right? Um, Theater is never going to be the exact same show every night, right? Because it's human bodies acting out this performance. So as it says, you can't step in the same river twice because the water is new, right? All of the time, moving and changing, and it's organic. And theater is the same way. You can try to recreate exactly, historically, how a play happened, um, but it's fresh every time. Right? It's lively in that way. 
Uh, I don't mean to say that theater is never boring. I will tell you, theater can be the best thing, and then at other times when it's bad, it can be really, really bad. I'm not going to try to pretend if you go to see a play that um, is poorly done that it's not less lively, right? But compared to other art forms, theater is something... um, that changes in time and it's not something static it's something lively it's a flesh and blood reality um, I'm a huge Saturday Night Live fan and uh, when I got went to Chicago I got to see the second city um, not the touring company but uh, at the at their theater in the second city um, and it was huge for me to stand in the room where these great actors Um, performed. Uh, You know, I'm a huge Stephen Colbert fan, so to see him on the wall and know that he acted in this improv group, um, it was just so exciting to have it there in the flesh and blood and to be there. And that can happen. um, uh, A lot of you probably pay extra money to go see a popular band that you like because you get to see them live. It's a different experience. It's something visceral about it. Um, Watching them sweat, watching them sing, it's uh, an engaging experience. And it's nothing new, right? Um, If we look back into Shakespeare's day, you know, he had uh, these famous performers that performed with him who became local celebrities. um, And it is definitely nothing new for people to want to go see celebrities perform. Um, the probably one of my favorite things about theater is the magic of it. When you go in to see a play, there is this sort of electricity in the air, especially when it's you know it's going to be good, right? Um, you know, I was a huge Lord of the Rings fan, and being um, in the Oldham Theater in Winchester, and uh, the very first movie, it was the midnight showing, and we were all sitting there waiting for the movie to start. Um, you know, there's just a special excitement f- of all these fans in the room. And the same thing happens at a concert. The same thing happens um, in a theater when you have that expectation that's in the air. This is our children's drama performance last fall, Babes in Toyland, and um, my favorite time of year is the children's drama. Well, let me clarify, I'm usually exhausted from directing the plays, but we bus in around 4,000 kids, um, and the excitement that's in the air, the little kids waiting on at bated breath to see the play, um, kids just have this extra energy that they bring into a performance space that is so exciting. Sometimes as performers we have to sort of calm them down because they're so excited, but that expectation of something great is going to happen in this room, something magical, something that'll be over in an hour and we we won't have a video of it, we won't you know be able to take it home with us, but it will be something that we experienced right? Um, And it's so exciting. So um, probably a lot of you, when you think of theater, you think of New York City. That is um, a perfectly legitimate association there. Speaking of celebrity culture, I um, got to see Cyrano de Bergiac um, played by Kevin Klein, who was probably my biggest crush growing up. I loved Kevin Klein. Getting to see him perform it live and in person, uh, that's me underneath the Cyrano sign there. Um, It was just, I was such a fangirl that night. It was so exciting. Um, And Cyrano de Bergiac is also a combat show. There's a lot of stage fighting in it. And uh, I, you know, I was an actor combatant in a former life. So to get to watch one of my humor icons Kevin Klein perform not only these great one-liners great romance scenes but also to watch him sword fight in person I mean it was just oh, I could die happy that night so when we think about Broadway what do we think it is a district a theater district now a lot of older towns have a theater district if you go to London it's in the West End if you go to San Francisco Boston Chicago all of these places are going to have theater districts It just so happens that Broadway was the name of the broadest road in the town, right? Broadway. And in New York City, it's um, Times Square 
So when the ball drops on New Year's Eve, that's in the theater district. Um, Tell all the gang from 42nd Street quote the famous Broadway song. I digress, but um, that's the theater district. But when we say Broadway um, theater, we mean specifically it has over a thousand seats. Um, Because the style of a Broadway show is indicative of the size of the space. So just as a sports team mascot has to make really large gestures. A Broadway show um, has a big spectacle, right? If we're going to see Phantom of the Opera, the um, big huge chandelier is going to drop. If we see Miss Saigon, we're going to have that big helicopter come in through the ceiling. Uh, It has this big spectacle to it, and um, the tickets aren't cheap because it's a big huge spectacle. Now some of you may have seen a Broadway tour, Right, that's my mother being silly there. And we went to go see Hello Dolly recently. It was fabulous. You should definitely go if you get a chance. Um, but that came to TPAC, the Tennessee Performing Arts Center. And there are multiple performance spaces in the TPAC. Um, the Andrew Johnson Theater is the big one that we saw Hello Dolly. That's the one that has over a thousand seats where you can see Broadway style tours. Now often that is the same choreography, the same design, the same direction, Um, usually a different cast, although sometimes you have the original cast come to different cities, but usually it's a touring cast. Um, But you're getting to see a lot of the exact same shows they created it on in New York. So um, once again, tickets are usually not cheap. Now, When you're asked to go see a live theater production, you do not have to pay the big bucks. I don't want you to see that $75 and think, I don't have the money, I can't barely afford books. Uh, There is free theater, right? This is just going to be, sometimes you get what you pay for, right? And many of these big Broadway style tours are a spectacle. It's almost like going to the circus and not just going to... um, a small town theater. Regional theaters are a great option. Um, Professional regional theaters. So I have a picture here of Eddie George because I had a wonderful experience at Nashville Shakespeare Theater and I will say I've had many wonderful experiences at Nashville Shakes. Um, They have a great in the park theater that they do every summer that is absolutely free. If you're taking this class in the fall it's probably still running right now in um, Centennial Park. You can go to downtown Nashville and watch that that play for free. There is of course a donations bucket but you're a poor college student you can just um, Um, beg off Uh, but when I got to see Eddie George as Othello once again watching him do stage combat um, you know there was a wonderful um, scene of him practicing sword fighting with Othello uh, with Iago and uh, it was just awesome acting too and so sometimes you get to see um, professional actors who are part of the union they're really seasoned actors and um, you get to see celebrities too even in a small town like Nashville, you know, that's not unheard of for um, professional singers too, to be in some of these Nashville shows. So you can catch some pretty big names if you're paying attention. A couple other regional theaters I highly recommend, um, the Tennessee Rep, the Nashville Children's Theater, if you have small children, um, they do great work, consistently great work. Um, uh, Cumberland County Playhouse, Um, you know, there's some great theater in Gatlinburg. We have a lot of really fun regional theaters that stay open, and some of them cater to tourists, but that doesn't make them any more or less talented than um, repertory theaters. So there's a picture of the cast that I worked with, Love Lawson, what I wore, um, at South Jackson. South Jackson is in Tullahoma, Tennessee, and it's a pretty small town operation, but it's where I spend a lot of my nights and weekends volunteering, stitching, directing, acting in shows, Um, and we just do it for the fun of it, right? There's um, not, nobody's paying us to do it, but it's just something that we do for fun. So um, you can totally see a community theater production for your um, class credit. Uh, There's wonderful 
community theater pra- uh, projects going on all over the state, probably one close to your back door. Um, Love, Loss, and What I Wore, I have this picture up here because it was a women's piece, and it was done during Women's Month, and it's definitely, it's by Nora Ephron, who's a famous screenwriter and playwriter, and it definitely catered to women. And if you have a special interest, there's probably a theater out there for you. So Springhouse Theater in Smyrna, for example, is a Christian theater that does Christian plays for uh, and holds all of their plays in a church, right? So whatever your thing is, there's probably an amateur theater to cater to what you like. And, um, you know, sometimes I will just say you get what you pay for, right? If you only paid $6 for admitting, uh, then just know that you can't expect Broadway style, huge, elegant uh, costumes, but that doesn't mean that you can't still have a great theater experience without all of the bells and whistles. So, so theater is something that happens professionally. Theater is something that happens w- with amateurs. And theater is also something that has happened all over the world through ri- ritual and religion, um, particularly. So this is no theater. It is done by Buddhist monks, and they wear these masks, and they believe, kind of like the Jim Carrey film <laughs> from the 90s, that if you put on that mask that you are being inhabited by your ancestor or by this deity that they're acting out and um, theater has existed we have lots of documentation all over the world in Africa uh, in uh, Scotland all of these places we have uh, historical things to support that I will often refer to theater um, synonymously with television and film. So I'll ask you, who's your favorite actor? I'm not asking you for your stage actor, just who's your favorite actor in any genre or any medium. And um, that's because almost all of these actors have done it all, right? Daniel Radcliffe, most of you know him as Harry Potter, but he's also been doing tons of theater, right? This is a picture of him from How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. So... Um, if they're a celebrity, there's a good chance that they've been on Broadway, off-Broadway, in the West End. They've done theater as well as film. And theater is the fountainhead, right? It is the ancient art that film and TV and other media draws on. So I have a picture here of the original script of Dracula um, by Bram Stoker. Bram Stoker was working backstage in a version of Macbeth by Shakespeare, And he was really inspired by all this blood talk when he wrote the novel. And he immediately turned around and wrote a stage play version. Um, And a lot of these great stories that we're talking about, um, they may have been a novel, they may have been a stage play. We'll talk in depth about The Wizard of Oz, right? Started as a novel, turned into a stage play, turned into a musical, turned into a film, and now there are as many versions of it, um, anime, sci-fi, so many manifestations of these great stories. So we can think of theater as a fountainhead, um, as a basis. Almost A lot of people working in entertainment have started with a theater degree, and now they're working in film. A theater degree, but now they're writing for television. A theater degree, but now they're um, on the radio, right? Because the basic fundamental skills are the same throughout, right? And it goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks, right? I showed you that ancient Grecian picture of the um, theater Dionysia, where uh, sitting on stone benches out in these larger-than-life amphitheaters, right? 2,500 years ago, it was established, these clear lines between comedy and tragedy through Aristotle. And we'll talk more about Aristotle next class. But um, theater and television draws on the same archetypes in these ancient scripts that have been around. Um, If you look at ancient Rome, the twins Menachemi, they're doing the same shtick that you can see on Friends, right, of um, uh, 
uh, mistaken identities and people coming in and out and uh, you know it's a lot of the same tropes as we would call them or shticks or the same kind of um, situation we have these archetypes I, the picture I have here is commedia dell'arte which is an Italian form and they would wear these masks that you would know who they were so you can see the one in the bottom um, right hand corner has a wart on it that was a servant right the one up in the middle in the center that was pantalone he was the um, grumpy old man and we have those same archetypes in sitcoms today and we see the same shticks in sitcoms today that have been going all the way back and a lot of that times that's because your writers have been trained in classical texts they're familiar with Shakespeare they're familiar with ancient Grecian tragedy and so they're using those same stories Shakespeare has a great quote, as the sun is daily new and old, so is my love of telling what is told. Um, good theater doesn't always explore something new. We're often telling those classic stories of good versus evil, true love conquers all. Um, you know, those themes don't go away. Those themes don't change. So we can go back to these archetypes. We can go back to these tropes and retell the stories. There's a picture of my husband, Davis. He's also a Motlow employee. Um, you can find him around the Moore County campus. Um, he works in marketing. So theater, at its essence, um, is a ritual. A lot of the ancient rituals associated with religion um, have a very theatrical bend to them, right? If, if I had gotten to the altar and my preacher had said um, do you take this woman to be your wife and my husband had said meh sure right that would have been a deal breaker uh, I wanted him to say I do because that is the ritual in our culture right um, baptism is another ritual that's very theatrical right there's a there's a visual um, storytelling that's going on in a Christian baptism, right? Circumcision is another uh, great example of a ritual and um, that often has a setting. It has uh, a way of doing it, um, you know, th that uh, is very theatrical. So perhaps the most primal ritual we have that occurred through the Native Americans in America, through the Africans, um, through um, many different cultures, is that putting an animal headdress on your head and reenacting the hunt. This is something we have great documentation of, and we can still see, if you go to a powwow here in the United States, you can still see um, the hunt done through these beautiful ritualistic dance dramas. Um, so I have a picture here of the Celts. Like I said, I have a lot of ties to Scotland, um, and the Celtic culture believed a lot in animism, which is the idea that an animal or an inanimate object has spiritual power. For Obviously for the Druids, it was um, trees. Uh, shamans or spiritual leaders would often do uh, close-up magic in order to establish their spiritual hierarchy and their authority to talk on spiritual things. Um, the mask is another thing that happened sort of we don't have any proof that the trade routes went as far as these natural instincts to put on a mask and act out a dance drama were um, so it's really something once again I feel that humans do innately is make drama right <laughs> drama is probably the word that I least like that's synonymous with theater um, but if it's going to be interesting, sometimes there's going to be violence involved. Save your drama for the stage, please. Uh, but theater happens anywhere where there is an audience and a performer. So by that definition, a schoolyard fight is a drama, right? We have a good guy and a bad guy, or at least two guys, and everybody watching there, right? A courtroom drama. Obviously, um, the, often the witness on the stand has been coached. They are behaving in a certain way, acting in a certain way in order to build sympathy with their jury. So um, I would argue that if you want to be a lawyer, 
take an acting class. <laughs> Some of you are having little dramas in your house at home as you listen to this script, right? You're trying to manipulate someone else's behavior uh, through your acting skills. Um, for, for better or for worse, I, I, I kid, I kid. But all the world's a stage, right? And we have to learn how to express ourselves emotionally in order to incite a response and um, create uh, attention when we need that attention, right? So our, our authors are really inclusive here. They add lots of examples of modern um, rock music, modern uh, pop icons, modern films, and I won't belabor that. Um, I think it's really interesting and good that he uh, is, that these gentlemen are trying to stay relevant and explain to you the importance of how theater has influenced pretty much every art form that we have here in America um, and across the globe. Um, but I will say a special little nod to cosplay. Um, I have tons of female costuming students who come in um, and a couple a couple gentlemen too who are just really killing it at cosplay and they are able to come in to uh, do costumes with me and I'm just continue to learn from them and it's so exciting um, and I think cosplay is something um, that is really not necessarily something new. I think it has a new name to it. Um, but the fan experience has always been part of what it is and to be in an audience. And I just think it's so cool and exciting to see it incite people's imaginations and um, giving them some self-expression. So um, theater is everywhere. Theater is... Um, the fountainhead of lots of other experiences in different types of media. Um, but perhaps most importantly, theater includes observations about the human existence on a deep level, right? One of C.S. Lewis's students famously said, we read to know we are not alone. And I think the theater is the same way. We go to the theater and we feel less alone. We can laugh at things with people and see that they're also having a group experience. Um, part of the reason I'm so involved in community theater is because it's a way for me to get out from behind my screen and have face-to-face -face interactions with people in live time and build meaningful friendships, not just fake social media influ uh, friendships, but true friendships where people can call me and say, hey, pick me up, I'm on the side of the road kind of thing. Um, I, I have found theater to be deep, a deep and meaningful art form. That's not to say that all theater is. I like fluffy entertainment too. I like jazz hands and tap shoes and sparkles, but um, I also love Hamlet, um, plays that dig into the inward significance of things. And that's what Aristotle really thought theater was supposed to be, um, hold a mirror as it were up to nature show her her true form and uh, have a meaningful look when we can analyze our heroes like the little mermaid like batman we can learn about our own culture deeply and what we value and what who we want to be who we aspire to be who our heroes are um i also call theater my soul food uh, which is to say um that when i'm feeling down or depressed um I can go see a play and I can escape my reality and I can have a good time, right? Um, when I was went to London with, uh, you know, um, with Motlow through TENSIS, the Tennessee Consortium for International Studies, uh, I was on a budget, right? That was only my third year teaching. I didn't have a lot of money. Sometimes I would skip lunch <laughs> to be able to go see a play that night because that's how important it was for me, right? Um, lunch was not as important as going to see that play. I call it my soul food, um, getting to ex these great experiences, these entertainment experiences. All right, moving into chapter two. So part of the way that we can define theater is whether it's spatial or temporal, right? So spatial art is like a statue. We find a statue in a museum, the Mona Lisa in a museum, right? That's spatial art. It's static. It doesn't change. It um, is able to be preserved, which is cool, right? 
But music, and this is a little plug for our Motlow music program, um, you can see Dr. David Bethay there leading our um, band and our choir. That is a temporal experience. So you are there, you can listen to it in person, and um, it's, you know, a timed experience. It's something that happens in a specific period of time and only exists in that specific period of time. Right, so theater is a little bit of both. I mean, it's mostly temporal, but we can also save the costumes, we can save the set pieces, and they live on after the show. And we have preserved these masks from thousands of years ago that were used in theater. But um, theater is mostly a temporal experience, right? Something that is um, in the moment. Here's another picture of Shakespeare's Globe and their performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream. So the only thing you need to do theater is an actor and an audience, right? The costumes are nice, the sets are nice, the lighting, the sound, all of that makes part of the experience, but truly the only thing you need to make theater is an actor and an audience. So we're about to go over the elements of theater. Number one element is an audience. Number two element is a performance, right? Number three element is a script. So little plug here, please make sure you get a copy of the piano lesson by August Wilson. You'll be writing your first paper over this play script by August Wilson. Um, a script is a blueprint and we'll use the word script and text interchangeably. Um, but a script is nothing but a blueprint for what the action. The action is the thing. The play is the thing. The drama is the thing. So when you see a script, just know that it's not necessarily meant to be read. I love Shakespeare, but I do not sit at home on a Friday night and read Shakespeare because Shakespeare wasn't meant to be read. It was meant to be performed live. In fact, in Shakespeare's day, they didn't have full texts. They didn't have their first folio until after Shakespeare died because all he did was write the sides for the actors and tell, you know, give each one their lines. Um, it was just meant to be an, a means to an end. It wasn't supposed to be the end in itself. So I say that I love scripts. I sit around and read scripts all the time as I'm thinking about what plays we should do at Motlow. They are the blueprints of the theater, but they are really a means to an end. Right, and so that character analysis that you'll be writing, I ask you to cite specific page numbers from the piano lesson. You can pick that up in the bookstore or find it um, anywhere books are st sold. There, it's a very popular script by one of the greatest playwrights um, that America's ever known. So there's David Crutcher. He may be your professor for this course. He's also teaching um, the online version of theater introduction to theater, and he directed a play called Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare, and he set it in Nashville in the 1970s, and these fairies kind of had, if you're familiar with Midsummer Night's Dream, there's the fairy world and then there's Athens, and so our fairy world um, was very inspired by um, by rock music, by the glamour of the 1970s, and the real world was Nashville, right? Very country. So when you see some of these pictures, that's kind of where these um, this mashup between the two areas uh, come from. So a director comes in and they're the boss. They give you a vision. They give you um, a clear goal. If you've ever been in any kind of athletics, the director's your coach, right? Um, they give a unifying vision for the production. So, and there's me. I was in the cast of this one um, on your far right there. This is our theater space. You can see the sound panels on the walls, and that helps with our acoustics. You can see part of the set there that we were working on in process. Uh, we have about uh, 300 seats. It's not a very big theater. It's definitely not a Broadway-style theater. You can see it's a proscenium. It has the um, fabric curtains hanging there, and we'll talk more about what a proscenium means later in the play. Um, 
This is Powers Auditorium at the Moore County campus in Lynchburg. If you ever get a chance to come see one of our plays there, you, you may, but you're not required to attend um, the Moore County campus production. For one thing, um, we don't want you there if you don't want to see it. <laughs> I've never been the kind of um, professor who said, you know, anything was mandatory uh, because theater's very, all entertainment is very specific to you. You know, what do you like? Do you like musicals? Do you like dark comedies? Do you like, um, you know, uh, something more romantic? Do you like something that's more goofy? Everybody has their particular tastes. So that's one of the reasons, at least if I'm your instructor, I'm not going to require you to see a specific performance because um, I want to account for your specific tastes and what you like. For example, I had a student in this summer class uh, in June. She went to go see Fun Home, which is a lesbian play um, about a girl coming out. And um, it's a very emotional play. And there were a lot of people in the audience. It's Pride Month who were weeping. And um, this was a very meaningful experience for them. And she felt very uncomfortable because that was not... Um, that play wasn't for her, right? It wasn't anything about her being a bigot or anything like that. It was just that she felt she was um, in an experience that wasn't hers, right? Um, you may go uh, to see a dinner theater and it's a house full of, um, you know, people of advanced age who were there to enjoy something that's like a jukebox musical from when they were kids and they're all enjoying this music and it may just not be for you right maybe you don't like doo-wop music and you were never interested in um, that kind of music so finding the right play for you is is part of the experience right and like I said picking the space if you go to see a Broadway style play it's going to be big and beautiful and expensive. If you see something more bare bones, it might be more gritty and interesting in itself. So, so theater design is part of the experience, right? Um, I did costume design Midsummer Night's Dream as well. You can see the two pretty clearly articulated um, worlds there. We have the fairy world, which was very glittery and um, fabulous. And then we have the local Nashvillians who are um, the rude mechanicals. He turns into a donkey. If you haven't seen Midsummer Night's Dream, these pictures are probably pretty bizarre, I'll be honest. But um, you can see that beautiful backdrop of the cityscape of Nashville that our very talented technical director, Kurt Krauss, created. He's a fantastic painter and woodworker, and um, he just makes these beautiful um, settings that really help elucidate the stories. I am so thankful for Kurt. Um, so theater is a collaborative art and uh, this is another Midsummer picture where Bottom the Weaver, who's the guy who turns into the donkey, who's one of the main characters of Midsummer Night's Dream, is advising all the people in the cast and bossing them around. I always say one of my favorite things about the theater is the people, but sometimes my least favorite thing about theater is the people. Um, the director has the vision, and then we all sort of, in faith, rally around the director and help create something that we enjoy or we think is meaningful and sometimes that process is painful as is any kind of collaboration sometimes it's really meaningful sometimes you get to the end of the play and uh, you finally have an audience and it just doesn't come out the way you intended it right and that's part of the risk and the magic of theater is that sometimes it's great and sometimes you're misunderstood and it doesn't work, right, unfortunately. But it's a collaborative art form. If you don't get along well with others, don't go into the theater because you have to work together in order to create theater. Um, here's a picture of me when I was in repertory theater, professional theater, oh, what, 15 years ago. And um, I had one performance. I was, uh, if you can't tell, the person in the purple dress there. I came out at the beginning of the show and I had about two pages of monologue. It was a matinee and the house lights didn't go out. And um, by house lights, I mean the, the audience, the lights over the audience. You know, when the show starts, it's supposed to get dark in the room. And it, the house lights didn't go off. And for some reason, that threw off my concentration that day. And I could not remember the beginning of my monologue. And I stood out there in the spotlight um, baffled for 
probably a whole minute before I picked up with my monologue. And we had multiple performances of the show, and I had to go back out every night and start that monologue, and I was terrified. (laughs) Um, Live theater can be exciting, but a lot of actors have very real actor nightmares um, where they're on stage and something goes wrong and they panic, and it can be terrifying. It's one of the worst experiences I've had in my 20-some-odd years of doing theater Um, And, uh, you know, not to lay that on you at the very beginning of the class, but I just say that to say something could go horribly wrong when you go to the theater. And sometimes that's funny and sometimes it's awkward. (laughs) Just being real with you. Um, And that, that was professional theater, right? Even in repertory theater, even in professional theater, things go wrong because it's live. And that's part of the lively art of the theater. So part of your responsibility as an audience member is to suspend your disbelief. And that's a William Coolridge uh, reference, if you're familiar with him as an author, or sorry, Samuel Coolridge uh, reference, um, that we suspend our disbelief. And that is to say that we have to let ourselves get into the show, right? We want to believe, we want to enjoy the reality of it. There's a great moment in Midsummer Night's Dream when Oberon, the fairy king, says, I am invisible and I will overhear their conference. And then he snaps his fingers. And Shakespeare is just assuming that you will suspend your disbelief and believe that the fairy king is invisible. If he says he's invisible and he snaps his fingers, he's invisible. Now, And then he goes on in the scene and he walks around through the other actors and they don't see him because we've established the rules of the game. Oberon says he's invisible. Snap, he's invisible, right? Um, And that's kind of the fun of the theater too, is, you know, Peter Pan, I can fly, I can fly if I have pixie dust. The fantasy writers set up what the rules are. Um, Famously, uh, you know, vampires in the last few years have gotten makeovers and the original Bram Stoker rules are different from um, Twilight rules, right? He's a vampire who can get in the sun, who twinkles like a diamond in the sun. That's part of the fun of fantasy writing is that the fantasy author gets to decide. And we as an audience or a reader have to suspend our disbelief. Now sometimes if the if it's a fun show and it's selling and you can get behind it then you can suspend your disbelief with us if it's a poorly produced show sometimes it's harder to suspend your disbelief right Um, because they're not doing a good job of creating that playful atmosphere where you want to go where they go emotionally with them so you as an audience member have a certain responsibility to suspend your disbelief but also um, know that it could be harder if the show isn't good Right. <laughs> this is another great moment in Midsummer Night's Dream um, where Helena and Hermia are fighting. Uh, there's a famous Shakespeare quote from Midsummer Night's Dream where Hermia says, uh, they say about Hermia, though she be little, she is fierce. You may have seen that quote around, though she be but little, she is fierce. And um, Helena is tall. And that was part of the way they wrote it. So Sarah, the the brunette there, uh, and and little Hermia, are fighting Um, and uh, I put a picture of combat in here because aesthetic distance um, is your ability to either get into a show and separate yourself from what's going on right part of the ancient question of theater is what is real and what isn't real Dionysus the ancient Grecian god of theater was the god of blurred lines, kind of like Robin Thicke, right? (laughs) Blurred lines. Um, He was the god of wine. So you have that kind of, am I drunk, am I not drunk? What's real, what's not real? He was also the god of theater. Um, You know, is this real, is this fake? And he was also a god of sex, one of the gods of sex, right? And so we have this question of um, what's real and what's not real. That is sort of something we're always playing with in theater. Kind of as we go into being an audience member, we can get caught up in it and enjoy it and get whisked away uh, if we let ourselves, right? And so you as an audience member, when you have a combat scene, sometimes it can throw you out 
of being able to enjoy the show because maybe you're worried about the safety of the people on stage, right? Or um, you're not able to suspend your disbelief because the fight doesn't look real, right? That can be one of the change challenges of any sort of dueling moment on stage is keeping the aesthetic distance so that you as an audience member know that those actors are safe. All right. The end of Midsummer is super goofy. We have a play within a play. Uh, you can see there's a guy in drag there with very fake balloon boobs. <laughs> um, if you're tempted to uh, critique my costumes here, just know that they are uh, the play within a play is by really bad actors. So the costumes are intentionally bad. Um, just have to say that because uh, anyway. Theater etiquette. So you as an audience member have a responsibility when you go to see your live theater performance. Um, the biggest responsibility is obviously your phone. Please, please, please leave your phone. Um, turn it completely off. Don't get it out for any reason during a play because I can tell you as a performer, it's so distracting to look out in the audience and see someone basking in the blue light of their phone. Um, it's just unacceptable. If you have an afternoon to waste on YouTube, you can go and Google um, different performers uh, calling out people in the audience for being on their phones. Uh, there are quite a few on YouTube, and they are very funny to watch how awkward it is for the audience member to realize, oh yeah, this is a live performance and the actors can see me with their phones. Um, it's also not unusual for the ushers to ask you to leave if you have your phones out. Um, it just, it's come to that in live theater. so. Please don't put your feet on the stage. Don't put your bag on the stage. Don't rifle through your playbill. Um, dress up a little bit for the theater, especially if you're going to go see a Broadway-style show. Uh, you know, wear your Sunday best. Um, because um, the theater is an immersive experience, and you're part of that experience for the performers. A good audience can make or break a show, right? And part of your responsibility will to be a, be a reviewer right? You can enjoy that play. I hope you enjoy a play. I hope you've done your research before you go in and you don't feel trapped in that audience. You don't um, feel like it's a play that's not for you. So please do your research before by reading other people's review. I recommend the Nashville Scene has some great articles about plays and whether or not they're worth seeing. Um, another Shakespeare play, Hamlet here, David Tennant's Hamlet, who um, he's one of my favorite actors. He was in Doctor Who, one of the former Doctor Who's, uh, if you've seen him, but um, he does a great job of describing his performance by calling it twitchy, preening, bright, arrogant, angry, isolated, and he's using all these great adjectives. Please, when you sit down to write your live production critique, don't just say, it was a good play, I'm glad I saw it, right? That's not a college level articulate critique. Make sure you're finding the words to really teach me about this play. Don't just speak in generalities because that's not a critique. That's not a review. That's um, not a college level argument. So please find the words to describe something in detail. So when you go into any sort of entertainment experience, you have to ask yourself, what were they trying to accomplish and did they accomplish it? So this is once again a picture of Babes in Toyland, which was our fall show. And there's a girl in a big pink poofy dress, right? You as a college student come to see a children's theater and you see a big pink poofy dress and you're like, oh, it's a princess trope, blah, blah, princesses. But... I, as the director, when I see her first entrance and she walks out in that big pink poofy dress and a huge gasp goes through the audience of little eight-year-old girls who are excited to see that pink poofy dress, right? Um, then I have done my job because the play wasn't for you as a college student. It was for those eight-year-old girls. And so I have created a character that they can identify and latch on to. Right, that villain in all black with the drawn-on eyebrows who laughs like ha 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 ha. Right, this was a melodrama play. I wasn't trying to do a nuanced, detailed, gritty drama. Right, it was a melodrama for kids. The pirates are the bad guys. Right, it's very textbook melodrama. So if you walked away and wrote a critique of Babes in Toyland and said, oh, there were so many tropes, the bad guy was so bad, the good girl was so um, 
pink and princessy, I just makes me gag, right? That's not a fair assessment of what was going on because I was doing a children's play for children and leaning into those melodramatic tropes because it's for kids, right? And because that's what the script is. The script is trying to attempt. So if you go into a soap opera and you don't like soap operas and you're tearing apart the soap opera, um, you know, a lot of great actors, Meg Ryan, um, Alec Baldwin, they've all done soap operas and they all did the same over dramatic acting because that's the tropes of the genre. So anytime you ask yourself, what was this play trying to accomplish? Did I go see a play that was right for me? Right? If you don't like musical theater, then think twice about paying money to go see a, a musical, right? And then if, if you think it was cheesy, well, that's part of intrinsically what it, musical theater is, right? Is this cheesy? So find the right play for you and then critique it based on what it was trying to attempt. Um, because I really do believe there's lots of great theater going on in Tennessee and you can find a play that you will like if you do some research beforehand, if you go in with an open mind, if you suspend your disbelief and try to enjoy the show, then um, hopefully you can grow in your appreciation for the theater. And I will be happy or your professor will be happy to be part of that process and advise you on which plays are probably going to be good and which plays might not be for you, right? So I hope you've enjoyed chapter one and two of our text and um, make sure that you are engaging the discussion boards, engaging each other and reflecting on the content before you take your quiz uh, over chapter one and two. As always, thank you for listening.